Doing a risk assessment without putting control measures in place, a bit like giving Anne Frank a drum kit for her birthday, it's pointless, dangerous, and everyone will think you're a twat. However, unlike giving someone an ill-considered gift, not doing something about the hazards that you've identified through your risk assessment will leave you in breach of health and safety law and will likely lead to you being called negligent by someone in a wig as they hand you a big fine or a prison sentence. But picking control measures is not quite as simple as just choosing some things that maybe may help keep people safe. And as with anything in health and safety, there are processes we must follow and laws we must abide by. So let's go through how we pick our control measures and keep people safe. However, before we start, can you help me control the risk of me actually having to do some actual work by hitting the subscribe button below? When applying control measures, we must legally follow something called the principles of prevention, which are outlined in the Management of Health and Safety at Work regulations. The best way I can demonstrate the principles of prevention is to work through an example. So imagine I need to go and do some work on the motorway. Now, a main hazard with working on a motorway is being struck by a moving vehicle. So if I walk into the middle of the motorway without any control measures, I'm going to have a bad time. Using our risk evaluation from the previous video, the likelihood of me being hit by a vehicle is almost guaranteed, so we can rate the likelihood as a 5. The severity of me being hit by a vehicle and travelling at 70 miles an hour is pretty much certain death, so again, the severity is the highest level of 5. This means the risk rating is 25, the highest it can be, so we definitely need to put some corrective actions in place. So, according to the principles of prevention, the first thing we need to try and do is eliminate the hazard entirely. And in our roadworks example, this is totally possible. We could just shut down the section of the motorway while I'm working and divert the traffic through the towns around me. Problem solved. We've eliminated the hazard and now there's absolutely no risk of me being hit by a car. And all it took was making thousands of people late for work and ruining the whole economy. Obviously, this isn't a practical solution in this case. However, in many cases, it is possible to eliminate the hazards from our places of work. Take window cleaners as an example. Back in the day, they used to climb up a ladder to clean your windows, which presented a fall from high hazard. Nowadays, they use a pole to clean your windows from ground level, and the fall from high hazard has been eliminated. They do a job, but at least you won't get caught in your drawers or end up with a severely injured window cleaner in your garden. Other examples include using conveyor belts to eliminate the need for manual handling and using a tile cutter instead of a grinder to eliminate dust and noise along with countless other hazards. One thing you should know is that eliminating one hazard often brings other hazards. So if you use a conveyor belt instead of manual handling, you're introducing hazards such as electricity and moving machinery. If you are introducing hazards that pose a greater risk than the hazard you're eliminating, you may want to reconsider. Okay, so we can't eliminate the risk entirely from our roadways example. So we go to the next section of the principles of prevention, which is substitution. Substitution measures replace the hazard with a different hazard of a lower risk or find a compromise in your elimination measure to make them more practical. In our roadworks example, we can't replace the hazard as I'm pretty sure that sponge cars haven't been invented yet. However, we can reach a compromise and shut just one lane of the motorway instead of the whole thing, meaning I'm isolated from the traffic but there's less disruption to everyone else. Other examples of substitution measures include swapping out that fine lead-based paint for solvent-based paint or better yet, water-based paint you won't get that sweet, sweet lead-based taste, but you will be safer. Sticking on the subject of pain, you could change the method of application. If you're spraying pain, you could increase the risk of inhaling, ingesting, or getting pain in your eyes or on your skin, whereas the chances are much lower if you use a brush or a roller to apply the pain. Thinking about tools, chainsaws are ridiculously dangerous. One thing that often causes injuries is they have a tendency to kick back and hit you. However, you could use a reciprocating saw instead as you won't get cut kickback with these and they're generally much safer. Substitution measures are great, but without additional measures, things could still go wrong. So 
I've shut down the lane of the road, but without any signage, extra cars will still come into the lane where I'm working and hit me. So next on the principle of prevention, we need to consider engineering controls. These provide a physical barrier between you and the hazard. In our case, we can put a full concrete barrier around the lane where I'm working to isolate me from the traffic. We see engineering controls a lot in the workplace, from guarding around moving parts of machinery, to handrails around stairs, to welding screens, local exhaust ventilation, dust suppression. The list is endless and includes anything that acts as a physical barrier to stop you interacting with or being harmed by a hazard. However, we still need to do more because we still haven't notified people about our lane closure. There is a concrete barrier in the middle of the motorway, which isn't ideal for our road users. So next, we look at our administrative controls. These are the rules that we set out, our checks and methods of monitoring, and generally the information, instruction and training we give to people that may be affected by the hazard. In our roadworks example, we would put signage in place to let people know a lane is closed. We would also lower the speed limit to 50 miles per hour, and we would put cameras in place to enforce that speed limit. At work, we have things like policies, procedures, safe systems of working to communicate rules and expectations to keep people safe. We also provide training to employees so they know how to work safely and provide things like inductions, toolbox talks, notice boards and signage to reinforce this training. We also have documentation like checklists and permits that add additional layers of control. The eagle-eyed among you may have started to think at this point that the controls seem to be getting a lot easier to defeat. It's pretty easy to go over the speed limit and there's nothing physically stopping you from doing that. Similarly, there's nothing to stop you from deviating from a safe system of work or completing a checklist. A rule is much easier to break than a solid concrete barrier. This is why as part of the admin controls, we have to put monitoring measures in place. In our roadways example, this will be putting average speed cameras to deter people from breaking the speed limit. In the workplace, we monitor through audits and inspections. These still aren't flawless. Things can be missed on audits and inspections, so issues can fall through the cracks. However, admin controls are still very important and are crucial to determining legal compliance if the HSE come a knocking. But next, we come to the weakest control of all, good old PPE. Personal protective equipment really is our last resort. However, for the novice risk assessor, it seems to be the go-to, and this is a common mistake when people write risk assessments. The problem with PPE is that if a hazard is close enough that it can be stopped by PPE, it is too close. Think about it, if I take away all of the control measures that we've put in place, the closing the lane, the barriers, the signage, and waddle out into the middle of the road wearing a high vis, I'm still gonna get mowed over. I'm not knocking PPE, it definitely has its place, but it's considered a last resort. Okay, so I have my control measures in place, let's take a look at how that's affected the risk. If you missed our risk evaluation video, you may want to take a look at the link above. So, from a likelihood point of view, we've drastically reduced the chances of me being hit by a car. I'm almost entirely isolated from the traffic and beyond someone defeating the barrier through an act of amazing automotive acrobatics, I am not going to be hit by a car. So, we can lower the likelihood from a 5 to a 1. From a severity point of view, we have lowered the speed limit from 70 to 50 miles an hour, so we could argue that there might be a slight reduction in severity. However, I would say that being hit by a lorry at 50 miles an hour would probably still kill me, so this remains a severity of five. On a side note, a lot of people believe you can't reduce severity, however, this is just one of those myths around risk assessment, which we busted in our five risk assessment myths video. Take a look at that up there. So, through putting corrective actions in place, we've reduced the risk from a very high level of 25 to a much lower medium rating of 5, which is a much more acceptable level of risk. Okay, so we've gone through the principles of prevention, but there's one last thing to bear in mind when you're putting corrective actions in place. Collective controls, i.e. controls that protect multiple people, are always better than individual control measures. 
let's say you have three people working on a flat roof. The individual controls would be that they all wear harnesses, meaning that they would all need harness training. All the harnesses would need to be inspected and checked before use, etc. Not to mention the fact that they are frankly going to get tangled up at some point and are going to be clipping and unclipping at points, meaning that they may be unprotected. The collective measure, however, is putting a temporary handrail around the roof, which would make work significantly easier and would offer more protection to the individuals doing the work. Next up on our risk assessment journey is the recording, reviewing and communication of risk assessments. So if you want to catch that last part of the series, make sure you subscribe to our channel and turn on notifications so you can be alerted to that when they become available. But for now, thanks for watching and stay safe out there.